There we go. So this chapter is not very long. Um, and pretty much the biggest thing in the chapter was that lesson video over the log stuff and the exponential stuff. So if you haven't watched the video, that's that's a big mistake. It doesn't mean like you're done for, but I would watch the video and do the assignment. It's the biggest thing. And there's a lot of stuff in that lesson. There's a lot. So if you were a little, if you didn't like that lesson, that's okay. I used to actually take that lesson and do it over three different class periods, like all that stuff. Like I used to just do the natural log stuff in one lesson, the integral of e to the x in one lesson, the derivative of e to the x in one lesson. Like that used to be three lessons. Last year, I was like, you know what? If I just do it all in one lesson, then we have, we have time to like practice it. And so instead of kind of, it gave us more time to review for the AP test was, was the point. Um, it saved time. So, but do you guys have any questions on that assignment that we can kind of clean stuff up? 59. 59, which, which page? There was like three different pages. Um, 331. 331, number 59. You know, it's funny. Someone yesterday asked that same exact question. Hmm. Was it like how to do it or like, the algebra that they did. What was their answer out of curiosity? Um, I don't know. I erased it. I don't oh. know. Okay. It was one minus two natural log two. Ah, yeah. Okay. Um, that's what I ended up with yesterday. That's why I was curious. Okay. So first of all, Emily, you made a comment that that test was just over one chapter, and you're right. Right, well, there's a lot of stuff we've learned. Um, one of the reasons, so there are a lot of calculus teachers around the world that do the the log stuff and the e to the x stuff at the beginning of the year with all the derivatives. I choose to do it at the end, and the reason I do is because it lets us revisit how to find derivatives, quotient rule, chain rule, um, all that stuff we did at the beginning. It lets us repractice that. The reason they do it early. There are a lot of problems on the AP test that involve logs and exponentials. And so if you do it early, you open yourself up to more problems you can do AP style. There's a lot of questions we haven't been able to do yet because they involve exponentials and logs. So that there's, there's pros and cons. So if I want to find the derivative of this, I am going to do quotient rule. So we have to remember quotient rule. Low, D high, now, if you haven't watched the video, you're going to get a very quick refresher right here. If you want to find the derivative of a natural log function, so in general, forget about this problem. If I wanted to find the derivative of natural log of 2t, the rule is it's u prime over u. It's the derivative of the inside over the inside. So the derivative of 2t is 2. The inside is 2t. And then I would cancel the twos out. That's your crash course on derivatives of natural logs. So for this, it's low d high. So the derivative of natural log of t is one over t minus high d low over low low. So t squared squared is t to the fourth. So did you get here? No, I didn't even know that you put quotient rule. Oh, well, then it's a good thing that we came back to this. Um, what some of you liked to do first semester, I remember, some of you would put t squared up and make it t to the negative second and then do product rule. There's a lot of people that like to do that. Either way is fine. So now I'm going to clean this up. So t squared times one over t, that's just t. And then I like to put the 2t in front of the log. Like anytime I have something after a log, I like to put it in front. So then I'm here. And then first semester when we did this, we, and had fractions, we had to work on our factoring. So on the top, since each of these terms have T in it, I can factor a T out. And if I factor a T out of each of these, I'm left with one minus two natural log of T. And then you can cancel a T out from the top and the bottom here. That final answer. Quotient. We are going to have a quiz next class. I just remembered that. 
It's supposed to get a lot of snow Monday and Monday night. Yeah. Yeah. I need to be prepared for an e-learning day on Tuesday. I'll figure it out. I wonder if I don't have, oh, maybe I'm just having you do it on the e-learning day. What do I have planned on my calendar? Oh, so your, your e-learning will be a quiz and video. Yeah. So yes, you'll do it at home as e-learning. What else on here? Yeah. Three forty, number nineteen. Oh, I wish they would have asked this one yesterday. Okay, so here, here's the thing. I want to make sure I kind of talk about this holistically. If you guys have a fraction. Okay, so this is this is important here. If you guys see a fraction that you are going to integrate, there's going to be several different ways of going about it. The first thing I would think about is u substitution. Now, here's how you know if you'll be doing u substitution. You're only ever going to have u be the denominator. Okay, I'll start with that. You will only ever have u be the denominator. And the way you know if it's u substitution, here's what I ask myself. I'm like, if I, so look at number eight, for instance, or seven, either way, look at seven. If I have u be x squared minus three, the derivative of that is two x, emphasis on the x, and x shows up in the numerator. Basically, if u is the denominator, make sure its derivative shows up in the numerator in terms of like variables and exponents. So five, same thing. That's what I mean in terms of exponents. So on five, I would have u be 2x plus five. Its derivative is two. Now, if there was an x on top, that's what I'm gonna talk about next, okay? So, so first and foremost, if like, look at eight. If u is five minus x cubed, its derivative is negative three x squared, emphasis on the x squared, which shows up up here. That's how you know you're doing u substitution. If, if u is the denominator, and its derivative shows up in the numerator or some form of it in terms of x's and the exponents, that's how you know to do u substitution. The other thing that could happen is this. I've never seen this show up on an AP test, but it is in the standards and they said it could show up. If the degree of the top is bigger or the same as what's on bottom. Let me say this again. So I'm trying to see if there's one where it's the same. I don't see one. I wish it, I wish it was. At any rate, is there one over on the other side? Oh yeah. So I'm 58. If the degree of the top and the bottom are the same, or if the top is bigger, we actually have to do long division. You guys remember doing long division? Maybe after I show one. So, so again, I've never seen it show up, but it is on the standards and it is something that could be an integration strategy on the AP test. So anytime the degree of the top and bottom are the same, or if the top is bigger, we have to do long division to, to break it down. So your, what was your question on 19? Yeah. Okay, so if I do 19, so I'm glad you asked about this problem. How did they not ask about this yesterday? <laughs> Yeah. Well, 11 is easier because 11, you don't have to actually do long division. You can just divide each term by X and split it up into two separate things. But 19 is tougher. On 19, that top doesn't factor. Neither does the bottom. So I'm, I'm going to do an easier one because of time. I'm going to do 15, if that's okay. It's the same, same concept. 
back, did I assign 15? I should assign 15 next year instead of 19. Because it's the same idea. It, it gets the point across that I want to get across. So if I'm going to integrate this, you know, my first thought is I should have u be the bottom. But if I have u be the bottom, the derivative is one. And then I still had all this stuff up here. It, it's not going to work out. But if the degrees are the same or the top is bigger, we do long division. So let me remind you, long division. So I put the numerator in the division sign. And I put x plus one on the outside. You guys remember the setup? A lot of you did synthetic division more often in algebra two. Um, but we're going to do long division. So when I divide, I'm going to do the first term divided by the first term. So x squared divided by x. x squared divided by x is x. Then I take x and I multiply it back through. So x squared plus x. Hopefully ringing a bell. See? Now I'm going to subtract downward. But in algebra two, when I teach this, I don't teach to subtract. I always said flip, flip, and add. I flip all the signs and then just add, because then you don't, you'd be amazed how many people mess up subtraction more than addition. So if I flip the signs and then add, it's less likely to make a mistake. So then it's negative 4x plus 2. And then I repeat, negative 4x divided by x is negative 4. Then I take negative 4 and distribute it back through. Say that again. What'd you say? Then I took negative 4x and divided it by 1x. I kind of repeated the process. Now I'm doing it again. And then flip, flip, and add. And now 6 is my remainder. So I have x minus four. And then the way you write remainder, you put plus six over x plus one. That you guys remember doing that? The whole reason we do this, like why we're doing this, this original fraction that we started with right here is the same as this result right here. They're, they're equivalent. So now instead of integrating this fraction, I can integrate x minus 4 plus 6 over x plus 1 instead. And now I can actually integrate this because x is just 1 half x squared. It'd be minus 4x. And then this was part of the video. If you have 1 over x or 1 over x plus 1 or whatever, it's in this case, it's going to be 6 and then the natural log of the absolute value of x plus 1. Again, I've never seen it show up, but it is in the standards. I forgot I assigned that, that problem, so I wish they would have said something yesterday about it. Oh, well. Too late. Maybe it'll come up again at some point. It won't. All right. <clears throat> I want to get, if you do have other questions, shoot me an email, and I'll be able to answer any homework questions on this. So I know it was a lot. I know I didn't get into the E stuff or anything like that, but just please make sure you guys are asking on that assignment that we do not have a lot to learn in this chapter. That is the big thing to learn. We do have some other stuff. We have some stuff today, but that's, that's the big one. Okay. All right. Cause so we don't have a lot of lessons left. We only have like six lessons left, seven lessons left, something like that. Not a lot more to learn. Okay. So today's lesson, we're going to learn kind of two different things. But they're each like small enough that I just put it together in one in one lesson. But it's two independent things that we're going to talk about. The first thing we're going to talk about is the relationship between derivatives of inverse functions. So in algebra two, and I always reference algebra two because I teach it, so I know what's taught there. I don't know pre-cal what they do in pre-cal. Did, did you do inverse functions in pre-cal? You don't remember? You remember here? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, first, I want to refresh your memories on the relationship just between a function and its inverse. Emily, do you remember how to find the inverse of a function? Isn't it like what you 
across the wire. Well, that's what the graph, that's what happens with the graphs. Yeah. yeah. But if I give you a function like this, how do I find its inverse? Yeah, so we're just looking at the function. Mm -hmm. You plug y into the x. And then, and, the and, then, and then you like find the y. Yes, you switch. You yeah, you guys all got that. You switch x and y, like you replace x and y, and then you get y by itself. I remember that. At all, ever? I have no idea what that means. That they do it. In, they do it in algebra two, even regular algebra two. I don't know. Well, then we definitely did it in honors. Yeah, Shelton, he did it. He did all my stuff. Okay, well, the good thing is you're never gonna actually have to do this. So that's a good thing. So if I wanna find the inverse of a function, I flip X and Y. And then I get Y by itself. So I'm gonna subtract one, divide by six. So it'd be X minus one over six. You're not going to have to find the inverse of a function on the test, but I, I want to remind you guys the relationship of these two things. So when we get to the actual calculus, it makes a little more sense. What's the relationship between a function and its inverse? Like what's special about those two things? You must be a terrible teacher if you don't remember what I taught a lot of you. Okay. So if you give me a number to plug in for x. Two. All right. So let's say I have this original function. And I'm like, you know what? I'm just dying to know what f of 2 is. Something inside of me, I need to know what f of 2 is. So let's find it. So I plug 2 into that original function. And I get 13. OK. Then if I go to the inverse function and I take 13, and plug it in for x, what should I get? You should get two. Basically, between a function and its inverse, the domain and range swap roles. The inputs and outputs swap places. So if I would plug 13 in to f inverse right here, 13 minus 1 is 12 over 6, I get two. Is this ringing a bell? That right there, that little, little ditty. OK. So what I want to do next is this. Don't worry about the graphs. In the past, I've, I've had my students do this exploration to kind of get an aha moment of what I want you guys to learn today. Well, then inevitably, most students mess up the exploration, and then there is no aha moment, and it was a waste of time. So I'm going to do the exploration to kind of show you guys the one thing that I want you to learn between derivatives of inverse functions. So I'm going to show you this exploration and I'm going to kind of do it for you. Okay. You okay with that? <laughs> All right. All right. So here's what the exploration says. It says you have two functions that are inverses of one another. F and G are inverses of one another. Okay. Then it says, find the slopes of F at three different ordered pairs and find the slopes of G at these three ordered pairs. And look at how the ordered pairs change. So on F, we're looking at 2, 8. On G, we're looking at 8, 2. On F, it's 3, 27. And on G, it's 27, 3. The X and Ys are flipping, OK? So I'm going to kind of walk through this. So it tells us F and G are inverses. It says F is X cubed. And it says G is X to the 1 third. And then it says, find the slopes at several points. Well, if it says find the slopes, that's derivative. We know that as derivative. It wants us to find f prime at those places and g prime at those places. So the first thing we have to find is f prime and g prime. So on F, it wants us to find the slope at 1, 1, 2, 8, and 3, 27. And on G, it wants us to find the slopes at 1, 1, 8, 2, 
and 27.3. So I'm going to take these x values and plug them into the derivative of f. So I'm going to look for f prime of 1. So if I plug 1 in for x, I get 3. And over here, when I look for g prime of x at 1, 1, I'm going to plug 1 in for x here. I'm just going to tell you these values. But if I plug 1 in for x here, I'm going to get 1 third. So the slope on f at 1, 1 is 3. And the slope on g at 1, 1 is 1 third. OK. Then I'm going to do the next ordered pairs. So if I do f prime of 2, so I'm going to plug 2 in for x here, I get 12. Now notice what I'm plugging in to g prime. I'm not going to plug 2. The 1, 1, I wish they didn't actually do that point. I need to just forget about that point. It doesn't drive the point home. Because what I'm plugging in, I'm plugging 2 in for f prime, but then I'm going to plug 8 in for g prime. And when I do that, I get 1 12. And maybe you can see where we're going with this. Then I'm going to plug 3 in for f prime. So 27. Mr. Walker, if you had to make a prediction on what g prime of 27 is, what would you predict? What would you say? One over 27. So the relationship, the one thing that I want you to know about derivatives of inverse functions is their slopes are reciprocals of one another. That's it. That's the only thing to learn on this is that the derivatives of inverse functions are reciprocals of one another. Very easy thing. But then I was doing some digging and I found a problem from, I think it was the 2012 AP exam. Might have been 2008, I don't know. But I saw this problem and it, it intrigued me because this problem was the most missed problem on that year's AP test. This problem right here was the most missed problem. And so I thought it was interesting. So I want you guys to do this problem. I want you guys to, at home too, I want you guys to do this problem and see what you get. I triple dog dare you. You must get an answer or else. There's 12 of you in here, and you're all going to tell me your answer. So you have to get an answer, and you're going to have to tell me an answer, whether it's right or not. You have to tell me why? No. No. You just have a one in five chance. To sweeten the deal, I'm going to have you all put your heads down, and you're going to vote that way. Yeah. And that way, you can't see, like, you know, if I say D and like eight people raise their hand, then you're like, oh my God, D. So you will not know. You guys ready? Okay. You ready now? Okay, put your heads down. <clears throat> have your answer ready. Make sure you know if it's A, B, C, D, or E. You have to vote. There's 12 of you, so I will know if someone did not vote. All right. 
How many of you say the answer is A? How many of you say the answer is B? How many of you say the answer is C? How many say D? How many say E? All right, heads up. <clears throat> There's our dispersion, our distribution. Dispersion, is that a word? I don't know. So there we are. Anybody at home want to chime in with what they think the answer is? Say. Who said that? A. Me. A. Josh Middleton. Anyone else on board with him? It's A. Who said that with such confidence? John? They're right. It is A. It is A. Uh, Let's go. <laughs> Thank you, John. Like, it's like the reciprocals. Like, that's it. That's the content. That's the concept. But it's not just that easy. And so you can see why it's the most missed problem. Zero out of 12. That's interesting. That's never happened. <laughs> but okay, so let's talk about why. Okay, let's talk about why it is. And it's all about the inputs of the derivatives. The most common mistake, pretty much everyone, because it is such a really quick thing, everyone's going to know, oh, inverses, reciprocals. Slopes are reciprocals. That's it. But the most common mistake is this. Students think if, and I'm just making these numbers up, they think if f prime of four is six, then g prime of four is one six. And that's not what's true. You're not plugging in the same x value in each derivative. You're plugging the x value of one point into one of them and the y value into the other. So what I have learned to do, because this tripped me up first time I did it too. Here's what I've learned to do with these problems. You see that, Stephen? Here's what I've learned to do. They tell me f of 3 is 15. So I write that ordered pair. I'm dealing with the point 3 comma 15. Okay. Then they tell me f prime of 3 is negative 8. All right, that's what they tell me. Then I stop and I'm like, what conclusion can I draw from that? The conclusion I can draw is not that g prime of three is negative one eighth. The conclusion is that g prime of 15 is negative one eighth. This is the part that we need to understand. If I plug three into f prime, I'm plugging 15 into g prime. Those are the values that are reciprocals of one another. So then it says f of six equals three. So that's the ordered pair six comma three. Okay. Then it tells me F prime of six is negative two. Well, then the conclusion is that G prime of three is the reciprocal of that negative one half, which was the question. Good stuff. So it's a real quick concept, but it can be tricky. Good job, those of you that went out on a limb and said, that was confidence. John, that was confidence. He yelled out, it's A. Not, I got A. I'm just built different, man. <laughs> well, all right. Okay. <clears throat> the next thing we are going to learn. So I, I'm going to do kind of a lot of uh kind of like with this like this stuff of finding inverses you're not going to have to find inverse functions that's not a thing you're going to have to do but i wanted to you know hit the point home on the in, the domain and range swap roles and that's why we're plugging in the x for one and the y for the other that was kind of all the lead up same thing on this side on this side all of this lead in all of this stuff is really just for you guys to know how to do this very last problem so we've done problems where you've started with differential equations. And what's your first step when you solve a differential equation? Se separate the variables. Separate the variables, separate the variables, separate the variables. You separate and then you integrate. The ones we've done up till now have been pretty easy. 
like it's been pretty easy to see, oh, we just moved the DX over to the other side and then we integrate. The ones you guys will come across are not gonna be as easy as what we have done so far. This is what happens a lot of times where you have X's and Y's and stuff on, on both sides and we still have to be able to separate and integrate, all right? But the lead-in stuff is gonna teach us kind of how to do that problem. So I'm gonna start with the compounding continuous interest formula. Anybody remember that one? Your interest compounds continuously? It's PERT. It's the PERT formula. Your, your interest is your principal times E to the RT. That's your PERT formula. Remember that? And algebra two, when I teach this, I, I always talk about how there's no bank in the world that you can walk into and say, give me the account where my money never stops growing. I want it to just compound continuously. It's not a thing. And so inevitably students are like, well, then why do we learn it? And why do you teach it if it's not, if it's not a thing? Which I completely understand. It's because students' brains understand money. But what it really leads into is just the general growth and decay formula, which is this. These formulas are the exact same. Every textbook uses a little different variable for that front letter. In fact, in algebra two, I probably need to change this. We just took a test on it. In algebra two, I, I do that, where N is the starting amount. But this is the general growth and decay formula. Have you ever wondered, gee, where does that come from? You have? Oh. Yeah, like, where'd that come from? Have you ever wondered? No. No? No? <sighs> yeah. Have you ever wondered? Oh man, that's that's the worst. It's not fun. What if I knew nothing and I've been teaching you all this wrong? Like, what if I'm just some bum off the street that started talking letters and numbers? And it's all incorrect. You would never know. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm going to teach you where this formula comes from. Okay. In doing it and in, in showing you where this comes from. It's me kind of showing you how to do this type of problem down here at the bottom. So are you going to have to know where this comes from? No, but it's kind of my lead in. So first of all, remember what it means for things to be directly proportional. That means as one thing goes up, the other thing goes up. Okay, that's what it means to be directly proportional. And if they say y is directly proportional to x, well, that means that y equals some k value that I don't know, times x. Some k, which I don't know what it is, but times x. That's, I know that's true. Okay. Well, the next statement says, if the rate of change of y with respect to time is directly proportional to y, then, well, a couple of things. We have to know how to notate this. How do we notate the rate of change of y with respect to time? Like how do we write that? Huh? The rate of change of y with respect to time. Oh, we got to know how to write this. This is cool. Anybody at home know how we write the rate of change of y with respect to time? John? <laughs> dy dt. Yeah. Dy dt. That's the rate of change of y with respect to time. It says the rate of change of y with respect to time is directly proportional to y. So this equals some k value times y. Well, think about what that means. The rate of change of y with respect to time is directly proportional to y itself. Basically what this is saying, I like to associate this with like a, a bunny rabbit population where you start with two bunnies, they interact, and then there's more bunnies, right? Now there's more bunnies, they're all interacting, and now there's more bunnies. They interact, and then there's more bunnies. So basically, as the bunny population is growing, the rate at which that population is growing is also getting bigger. It's growing faster. The more bunnies there are, the quicker the bunny population grows. Does that make sense? That's what this is saying, okay? 
as the population gets bigger, the population grows faster. Well, let's solve this differential equation. And what it means to solve a differential equation, it means we're trying to undo this derivative. And to undo a derivative, we integrate. But when you solve a differential equation, remember, as soon as you put, if you put the integral symbol right here, you immediately lose all your credit. Step one, you have to separate your variables. When you're solving a differential equation, separate the variables, separate the variables, separate the variables. Now, up till now, it's been pretty easy to see how to separate. This one's a little tougher. So here's how we separate. I need to get this y right here on the left side with the dy. And even though there's no t's on the right side, I still need to move this dt over to the right side. So I'm moving the dt to the right side, and I'm dividing both sides by y. K is just a constant. K, K is not a variable in the problem. K is a number. So that's why it's not a variable. So it's going to look like this. 1 over y dy equals k dt. So that, that's worth a point. On your AP test, when you're solving a differential equation, just doing that is a point. Now we're going to integrate both sides. We're going to integrate the left side and integrate the right side. And this is where the lesson video comes into play. When we integrate 1 over y, that's the natural log of the absolute value of y, for those of you that didn't watch the video. Be careful with that. Kind of a little side note. If I said integrate 1 over y squared, we would not do natural logs. We would rewrite this as y to the negative second and do our normal power rule like we know how to do. So be careful with that. On the right side, when you integrate a constant like k with respect to t, that's just kt. It just adds the t on the end plus c. Now think about what we're trying to accomplish. We started with a derivative of y, and we're trying to go backwards to find y, we're trying to get y by itself. In physics, those of you who are in physics, I think he says like e it, e both sides or e it or something. I don't know. But in algebra two, what I tell you guys is when you're dealing with a log equation, switch it to exponent form. So the base here is e. When you're dealing with ln or natural log, the base is e. So if I switch this to exponent form, it would be e. This is my exponent. So it'd be e to that power equals the thing inside of the log. At this point, the reason the absolute value can go away is because any exponential function with a positive base, which is what I have here on the left side, this left side will never be negative. There's nothing you can raise e to to get a negative value from possible. So you can drop the absolute value because this will always be positive no matter what. Well, Stephen, I promised you I was going to show you where this formula comes from. Almost. Because these look very similar. But this does not look exactly like this. So I need to show you guys one little manipulation here at the end. This is kind of where some students don't follow, so I'm going to try to do this slowly. But if I take e to the kt plus c, this expression right here is the same as e to the kt times e to the c. I want to stop and explain that. And you all know that, but you all know it in the reverse way. In algebra one and algebra two, you're always asked to multiply two things with the same base. So you keep the base and then you add the exponents, right? If I multiply these two things, I would keep the E and then I would add KT and C together. So you all know how to go in this direction, but it works in both directions. Well, think about what C is. C is some arbitrary constant, some arbitrary number that we don't know. So what is e to the c power? Some arbitrary constant that we don't know. So we can just replace this whole thing here with c, a different arbitrary constant. 
And then if we just put it out in front, there's where that formula comes from. Basically, that formula stems from any time you have a rate of change of a population growing as the population grows, this formula generates. That you don't need to know so much. What you do need to know is getting from here to here, like knowing how to separate, knowing how to integrate, knowing how to manipulate with the natural log. That's kind of the skill. So we're going to do this very last one. We're going to skip the fruit flies. Side note, I was teaching summer school here a few years ago, and all my kids, they it was uh, Fourth of July weekend. So on the Friday, they threw all their garbage away in the trash can. My room wasn't on the summer school cleaning list for some reason. So we came back after a three-day weekend, and they had all bananas and apple cores and stuff in the trash can. And I walked into the room, and fruit flies were just everywhere in the room, swarmed the room. It was a different room than this one, but I had a new class in the library that day. I don't know what they ended up doing. I don't know if they just die. I don't know. Anyway, fun day. So we're going to do this differential equation. This is what you guys are going to come across. These types of differential equations, okay? Step number one, when you're solving a differential equation, separate the variables, separate the variables, separate the variables, and oh yeah, separate the variables. So I'm going to move dx to the right side, and I'm going to divide both sides by y minus one. I'm moving all the x's to one side, all the y's to the other. So it's going to be one over y minus one dy equals x squared dx. These types of problems, you know, I mentioned how on an FRQ, you're trying to get to five or six points. When, the, when, a type, when a problem like this is one of the parts of the problem, they're generally five points of the entire FRQ. You get a point for separating. You get a point for each integral. That's three. You get a point for finding the C value. And then you get a point for plugging the C value in and solving correctly. Like these are very important problems to know how to do. So I separated. Now I'm going to integrate. When I integrate one over y minus one, that's natural log of the absolute value of y minus one. I don't have a lot of room, so I'm going to do this on another sheet. On the right side, we get one third x cubed plus c. If you don't, so there's always a note on the rubrics. If you don't put plus c here, it says the max you can get is two out of five points on the problem. Because then you technically didn't integrate the right side correctly. So you don't get that point. You're not going to be able to find C correctly. And then you can't get the answer right. So you can get two out of five points. At this point, you guys have two options. I'm going to show you both ways. So when we've solved these so far, my advice to you has been plug in your point right now to find the C value. And you can. It's not wrong. Like at this point in time, you can plug in zero for X and three for Y and find the C value. I, I'm gonna show that way. I would not do it that way. Okay, I'm gonna show you the other way first, the way I would do it, then I'll show you that way. What I would do is kind of like what we did here. Before I do anything, I'm gonna try to get Y by itself. I'm gonna try to manipulate this, do E to the right side equals Y. I'm gonna do this process before I plug my point in. So I'm going to do, e to the one third x cubed plus c power equals y minus one. Because now what we can do is that manipulation where instead of having this plus c in the exponent here, I'm actually gonna pop it out in front and make it be a different c value. This is probably how you'll, you'll more likely see it. And then I'm also going to add one over to the other side. One thing that's really important, number one, I need you guys to know that you're just taking that constant and moving it out in front. But the bigger thing to understand is this C value here in the exponent is different than this C value here out in front. Like I'm not, you're not allowed here. This is important for you guys to get. If I had this, you are 100% not allowed to be like, oh, 
Like that is not allowed. But this C value is different than this C value. And you'll see the relationship here when I do it the second way. But I, the last step, I need to find that C value. So now I'm going to plug in zero for X and three for Y. So if I plug zero in for X, E to the zero is one. So C plus one equals three. So C is two. The reason I would do it this way, typically they're gonna want that C value out in front because when you're dealing with, with populations and stuff, like that's your initial population. When that number's out in front there, that's your initial value. And so that's what they're gonna to wanna to see there. Here? I plugged it. So in the problem, it says um, when X equals zero, Y equals three. So I plugged in zero for X and three for Y. And when you plug zero in for X, that E to the zero becomes one, so it goes away. So you just have C left there. <clears throat> the other way to do it, which I, I wanna make sure I show because there are gonna be people that are likely to do it the other way. The other way to do it is after you integrate, so I'm going to go back to that step. After you integrate, some people are going to plug in zero and three here, which is fine. It's not wrong. So if I do that, if I plug three in for Y, I would get natural log of two and then equals C. So notice I got a different C value. That, that's okay. Because here's what happens. So now if I plug natural log of two in for C here, look at what happens. So now I'm going to switch it to exponent form. Now I need to get y by itself. So it's going to be e to that power equals y minus 1. And the way we can make this look like this answer is by doing that little property thing that I was talking about right here. So the manipulation is this. I can write this as e to the one third x cubed times e to the natural log of two. What is e to the natural log of two? Just two. e to the ln of two is just two. This thing here is two. And so that's where you get that two in front of. And then add the one over. It doesn't matter how you do it, but the reason I would do it the first way is because then you don't need to know this, this little step right here. You don't need to deal with that if you do it the other way. Okay, that's a lot. So for e-learning, you guys are going to have a quiz. I don't mind if you use your notes or, or work with someone else, that's fine. Um, it's to make sure that you guys understand the log stuff and the E stuff. So do that. There's going to be a lesson video on that also. Um, your homework tonight. So your homework tonight, there aren't a lot of practice problems for this type of stuff. So I just found a free response question for you guys to do. And I put the rubric on there. So all you have for homework, guys, is a free response problem to try. And if I'm picking a problem out of all the ones I could, it's for a good reason. So give yourself like 14 minutes and try the problem as best you can and check the rubric and see if you can get to six points. Start trying to assess yourself. Uh, but that's it. You have that for your, that for your response question and rubric. So, oh, that was sad. You guys at home are free to go. Farewell, little ones. <laughs>